Hello, this is John Loveless, and this is a presentation I've put together about energy efficient ways we can save the world. One of them is building your own electric vehicles. Now, we live on a world of 7 billion people and growing, and if there was only, if we all lived an American lifestyle, the Earth could only sustain a billion people. And since half the population ascribes to an American lifestyle, we're kind of in big trouble. Now, I was raised uh, in a simpler time where you change your own oil and you bury it in the backyard. It doesn't really matter. It's not going to make an, a dent in the overall picture. Uh, but then in the year 2004, I received the recycling bin from the city and didn't think it would make a big difference because I don't drink pop. I don't describe to the newspaper. I didn't think... A uh, recycling bin was a necessary thing for the for a typical person in my situation. But boy, was I wrong. Everything is recyclable. And uh, I became aware of how wasteful we Americans really are. It was almost like a religious conversion to me. So I began looking around at other things that uh, maybe I'm unknowingly throwing away. I began to be more aware of my utility bills and to look for ways to be more energy efficient. And I got a kilowatt meter, and I was amazed at how much power my appliances were consuming. So I started going around the house and trying to find more energy efficient things to do, uh, like the compact fluorescent light bulbs, and adding attic insulation, tuning up the furnace, and upgrading appliances to more efficient things, like a PC power supplies, getting more efficient ones. And I began looking at phantom power usage. Now, phantom power usually serves a useful purpose, like the remote control on your TV. It's nice to be able to just push a button and have your TV turn on. But often, uh, the phantom power uses a lot more power than the device you're wanting to run. For example, the microwave oven it takes more energy to run the clock, display, and buttons than to actually cook something for two and a half minutes a day. So I went through my entire house of of uh, appliances and I actually measured all the phantom power usage and it was about 180 watts of just stuff that was running all the time that was a real surprise to me so I kinda went through and pared things down and found ways to uh, eliminate the usage and I actually got it down to about 96 watts for about a $65 a year savings and I'm I'm not done there's there's even more things I can do um, I looked at my uh, swamp cooler see if there was things I could do to improve it, and there were. Uh, you can tune it up and make it a lot more efficient. Um, but I wanted to get, uh, main, the main part of my topic here is I wanted to get into solar panels. But uh, Then one year I was researching the panels and I got a phone call from the telemarketer. A few weeks later I got my panels. Solar panels, they just make a lot of sense financially. Uh, there's amazing federal and state tax credits and rebates and often utility company rebates. Uh, it's possible in the state of Utah you could actually buy a solar system that will do 100% your, of your house needs and in, after it all said and done you'll only be out of pocket about 2200 bucks. The thing will pay for itself in two years. Um, that's not always the case, but there are programs out there that make it extremely affordable. Even if there were no programs and you had to front the entire cost of the solar panel and you uh, wrap the cost into a home loan, uh, it would it would actually be cheaper than what you're paying with for electricity. Uh, the state of Utah has fairly cheap electricity, and even then, uh, at seven eight cents a kilowatt hour, your your mortgage increase would be less than your electric bill. And your and it would be tax deductible, and your electric would be fixed for the next 30 years. Um, in the words of Lord Kelvin, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So uh, there was a device I bought for my house after I got the solar panels called the TED 5000, and uh, it's kind of like the kilowatt meter, kilowatt meter. The TED is more of a hardwired thing. It's got voltmeter and current clamps that measure anything running in your house, the whole house consumption. And it 
ended up I ended up saving 20% off my electric bill just because I was aware of how wasteful I was. It wasn't a lifestyle change. It was it was uh, just a behavior change. But I didn't have to change my lifestyle. I didn't lose any convenience or luxury in that process. So I thought, boy, this is great. What else can I change? So I thought, uh, let's look at the car, the gasoline. Maybe I can make my car more efficient too. So my commuter car became my mobile laboratory. I uh, got a vacuum gauge for that car, and I was able to correlate to fuel efficiency. For my wife's van, I got a scan gauge. Those things were amazing. They could measure all sorts of parameters. Uh, you can instantly see how wasteful your driving habits are, and it will change how you drive. As you stomp on the gas and you see that two miles a gallon as you're accelerating, you'll want to ease up on the gas a little bit and make it maybe seven miles a gallon. And uh, kind of a fun game I play when I'm driving on a trip, a road trip or something, and I try and get the highest possible gas mileage as I'm cruising along. And uh, really it doesn't add a lot of time to your commutes. A few seconds here and there is all. Um, but in my gas driving days, I got really into improving my gas mileage on my 92 Honda. And its fuel consumption went from 24 miles a gallon to 50.6 miles a gallon, a 102% increase. I'm just doing these a uh, few basic things and a few more extreme things and a few extremely extreme things. Uh, I started out with simple things like you know, making sure you have proper tire pressure and uh, and then I started doing things like removing power steering and air conditioning and installing a kill switch. Uh, there's a lot of amazing things you can do though that aren't extreme. Like driving 55 versus 75. It adds four minutes to your commute, but you see you increase your fuel consumption by 13 miles a gallon. In this example, accelerating a little slower, using zero W30 synthetic oil, putting in less gas at a time if you're uh, carrying all that extra gas, especially if you're in the city where there's a gas station on every corner, why not? Um, anyway, a lot of different things you can do to improve the efficiency of cars. But the best way to improve your fuel economy is by adjusting the nut behind the wheel. That's you, the one driving the car through behavior changes, through uh, driving carefully and driving techniques, you can increase your fuel economy the most. Now there's a group uh, called Hypermilers, and you can go to the website echomotor.com and they just have a lot of good ideas for increasing fuel economy. Some are very simple, some are a little more complicated, and some are downright fanatic, but they will save you gas. You can go as far as you want to go with it. Um, but then I thought to myself one day, why don't I just eliminate the most inefficient part of the whole process, the internal combustion engine? They're, they are inefficient, they pollute, they're, they self-destruct, and they require a lot of maintenance. Now to illustrate this point, uh, let's take a look at the amount of energy in a gallon of gas. Uh, there's 125,000 BTUs in one gallon of gasoline, or the equivalent of 36.6 kilowatt hours. Um, a typical American car gets 20 miles a gallon, and it's only 15 to 20 percent efficient, whereas an electric car gets about 100 to 125 miles a gallon of electricity, and is almost 85 percent efficient. So you've got way better fuel consumption and way higher efficiency consuming that fuel. Whether it's gas or electricity, you're you're consuming energy. You're using that energy and you just want to have an engine that consumes it most efficiently and utilizes all that energy. Now like all new paradigms, um, they're met with opposition and electric cars are no different. You know, a lot of the, There's a lot of naysayers out there and uh, there's a lot of opposition from the status quo. Some things just may never. They just don't know what. They just don't want to change. Um, and I want to go over this slide here about the um, the internal combustion engine versus electric car, the environmental impact or environmental burden. 
Now there's these uh, four graphs here. Uh, one of them is the ability to use up natural resources. Another one is global warming contribution. The third one is the total energy demand. And the fourth is an overall environmental damage indicator. The uh, EI-99 here. Now take a look at this. The first section across all four graphs is a gray area. And that's road construction. The second little section is the glider, the body of the car. They're pretty similar whether it's gas or electric. It's just the body of the car. The third crosshair, the, the uh, diagonal cross thing here is the drivetrain. Electric cars have a little more efficient drivetrain, but they're essentially the same. The fourth one is the maintenance. Electric cars do have lower maintenance, environmental-wise, damage-wise. It actually costs a lot less to the owner, but the environmental damage is about similar to a regular car. And uh, the fourth section is the battery, which is a huge um, tax on the environment. It's a, it's a burden to the environment. And initially, you think, you think, you know, you take a brand new gas car and a, and a brand new electric car, and you think, these are, boy, electric cars are really burdensome to the environment. Well, that's just to where the car is made. From here on, you see this, this uh, last section where these crosshairs, these uh, diagonal cross things are, is, and the, bird, the electric car is so much more efficient than a gas car. It's, a gas car would have to get about 90 miles a gallon to equal the efficiency of an electric car and to uh, equal out the burden of the car. And this is based on the electrical, uh, the how they generate the electricity for the electric car. And as the grid gets more efficient and more clean, the car will actually get cleaner. Uh, this graph is based on uh, a bunch of, you know, partly coal and some hydro and some natural gas. But if it's all on hydro, it would actually uh, be even 40% less on this graph. So hands down, electric cars are way better on the environment than a gas car overall. Um, here's next. This next one is about the environmental burden about the battery itself. Uh, I won't go too much into that though for now. Um, but there, there is a concern about lithium. Uh, there's a shortage of lithium in the world. But even with our current world reserves of lithium, uh, you could build two billion electric cars with our current lithium reserves if they were to all go towards lithium batteries. Now another reason to go electric is the uh, air quality improvement. Uh, this graph here shows an example of the energy, uh, the, uh, the uh, air quality in the United States. And this particular day, about a year ago, uh, the Wasatch Front in Utah had some of the worst air quality in the nation. Because of our, uh, our mountain range we have here, it has an uncanny ability to trap pollution for days at a time. And electric cars would eliminate that. Uh, Utah is not really a state that's pro-electric car, but it, that would certainly help that situation. Um, the Geo Metro conversion was my first car that I've tried to convert. and uh, But after I moved to a different city, I was, I was no longer within the range of the design and my interest faded. I consider that my greatest failure, but it, I, just, I just gave up on that project. Um, the Nissan Leaf re-peaked my interest in electric cars again, but after, on the wait, after I was on the waiting list for a year, I thought, you know, maybe I should try my hand at converting my own car again. Besides, no one ever says, ooh, good job at buying that car. And you don't get in the news for buying a car. You get in the news for doing something you can be proud of, like build your own electric truck. And... Uh, Electric vehicles, they vary in price from $500 to $125,000. You can get one like on the left here. It's a nice little pickup truck. Or this ugly one on the right, this Tesla here. By the way, that Tesla is really, really fast. The acceleration is unbelievable. I believe it's uh, 0 to 60 in 3.9 seconds. And boy, yeah, I got to drive one a few months ago, and boy, that was an experience. Uh, the White Zombie is the world's fastest street-legal car. 
if it's an all electric car, it just smokes any kind of competition they put up against it. Nothing can really beat it. It's just so fast. And it's funny because it's this just unassuming Datsun. And the thing is cruising. Now, the neat thing about electric cars is the pollution. People say, oh, well, the pollution just goes from the tailpipe to the smokestack. Well, yeah, that's a good thing. The pollution is out of our air, out of our faces, and it's pushed to the smokestack where emissions can be more strictly monitored and controlled. That's a very good thing. And the pollution is further away from populated areas, and it happens at night when most people are inside, not breathing the outside air. That's when most electric cars are charging up. It's at night. Electric cars don't need to warm up, and during rush hour, pollution is the lowest. And you don't have to, you know, in the morning you don't have to turn them on and let them run forever. Maintenance is lower. Um, less brake wear if you have regenerative brakes. And they're super quiet. And if you work on your own cars, electric cars are extremely clean. And uh, I can almost work in my Sunday best. And they just do not, you just don't get greasy working on an electric car. It's really nice. Um... There's a new technology they're developing, uh, actually using electric cars to level load the grid. And the way this will work is, is the grid will communicate to the car and say, Car, this substation's a little low. We need to borrow a few kilowatts. Can you spare a few? And the car will say, Sure, here's 80 kilowatts. Uh, I don't have to go anywhere for the next hour and a half, two hours, so just pay me back before you need it, before I need it. And uh, the grid will borrow it to prevent a brownout or blackout. And when things level out, it'll, it'll uh, pay the car back. And uh, the grid is happier. The car gets its electricity. The owner has no awareness that it's all happening. And uh, everything is everything's happy. So electric cars will save the grid. They're not going to cause it to be any more of a burden on the grid. Now, in my electric truck... Uh, it takes about 12.8 kilowatt hours to drive 40 miles. It's about 90 cents of electricity. Compare that to uh, a 20 miles a gallon vehicle. It's like only paying 40 cents a gallon for gas. And I also have solar panels, so it essentially costs me nothing to drive to work. So how do you convert a car to electric? Well, you need a good donor vehicle have something that'll last you a while. You need to decide what kind of motor you want, whether it's AC or DC, what type of batteries you want, what do you want to use it for, and how much can you afford. Once you answer those basic questions, you can uh, narrow down the design a little bit here. Once you get that donor car, you want to wash the engine compartment. You need to have a place out of the weather you can work for a while. You can uh, remove all the engine parts sell all the parts on the internet or your local news listing, uh, fix any problems and uh, off you go. I made 600 bucks selling all the unnecessary parts. You know, things like engines. After two days work, the truck was ready for the next step. I tried my hand at painting it myself and uh, I've never done automotive body painting, but I read up on it a little bit, did a very crude amount of prep work, and I was extremely surprised with how well it turned out. Uh, I was amazed that a gallon of $20 industrial metal paint uh, would look so good. Um, and, it, and initially the donor vehicle might not look very good, but after a few hundred bucks, uh, it'll be your baby. It'll look great. And while you've got it all torn apart, it's also a good time to do any repairs on the drivetrain or the brakes or whatever it may need. And you want to take some measurements of the of the shaft, transmission shaft, uh, for the next step here. Uh, this is slide 44 here. The uh, flywheel, uh, this shaft coupler was was made for this flywheel so that the electric motor could couple into the existing transmission. I got my motor and tested it out and verified it worked well. 
uh, made a little keyway for the motor shaft. The motor was missing one of those, so I just made one out of a file. Put it all together, mounted on this rappel housing thing. This uh, red paint here looks like it's blood, but it's just spray paint. I was using that to help align these holes, or help so I can drill holes in the right places. But that's not blood, it's just paint. And maybe a little bit of blood, but mostly paint. I uh, made this little motor mount on the motor. Uh, there's the motor with a this uh, transmission housing plate on it. Got it all set into place here. And I bought me some batteries at Costco. These are just six volt golf cart batteries. And I set them in the bed of the truck. I just kind of have to figure out how I'm going to have them all lined up and mounted. Got me a welder so that I could begin welding these battery boxes here. Uh, welding, by the way, is so fun. You, you've uh, almost a career changing move getting into welding. It's a lot of fun. I uh, made a box on the front here as well. Um, oh, I should warn you that the following is an extremely simple design. So if you if you, if you can change your own oil, you can do this. It's really easy. I, to be honest, it was really intimidating going through it at first, but in hindsight, it, it's just extremely, profoundly simple once you get all done with it and look back on it. And here's the schematic of the whole vehicle. I think about the original wiring harness in this truck. Now this was a real basic model truck and it's got a two inch diameter bundle of wires going to this engine. It's like, geez, this is a gas engine. Why does it have to be so complicated? Well, that's because gas engines are complicated. Uh, but electric cars aren't. You've got a motor, a controller, contactor, a little pot box. Think of it as a volume knob for controlling the speed of the car. And your battery pack. Just extremely simple design. It doesn't have to be complicated. Um, for the 12 volt accessories battery to uh, run the lighting and all the indicators on the tr on the existing truck, I just made a DC to DC converter out of a computer power supply. No sense spending lots of money on one; just make one on parts you have already on hand. I have a kind of a lab in my basement where I do a lot of the work. Um, attempts of uh, early wiring up everything and controlling it and uh, putting it all together here. Uh, I have four batteries in the front of the truck here and uh, here's a picture of the the rear batteries. There's 16 of them total. Got them all mounted up on this uh, battery holder here. I was concerned about people's reactions when I would pull into a parking lot and they were freaking out with all these batteries in the back so I built this case to keep them discreetly out of the way. There's nothing dangerous about it, just just people are concerned easily with new things. Uh, I have a battery tester here to verify all each cell was good, each battery is good. I took my uh, instrument cluster out. I removed the, the gas gauge and the temperature gauge and put in a voltmeter and an amp meter. Now the amp meter is kind of a gauge of how quickly your battery is discharging and the volt gauge is an indicator of how soon you're going to be hitchhiking. Now it's, it's a very good indicator of, of life left in the battery. In this example, if I, if I while I'm cruising down the street, if it reaches 100 volts. I know I'm. I better get home quick, but um, it's a very good indicator of range. Uh, here I have my controller mounted on this enormous heatsink. It keeps things really cool, and you can kind of see up in the left there a little bridge rectifier. That's part of my charging circuit. Um, there's just another picture of some uh, tests I was doing with this. Uh, amp meter measuring the amps uh, while cruising down the street. Um, this controller actually has this, this interesting 
feature, it actually quadruples the amps going into the motor at low RPM. Kind of an interesting thing. But it does not violate the laws of thermodynamics, so, uh, you know, we have to conserve all our energy here. Um, 12 volt, 120 volt DC battery charger costs upwards of 1500 bucks. So I made me a really simple one called a capacitive charger. It's uh, just a basic bridge rectifier and a capacitor. And the capacitor is a uh, creates a capacitive reactance which sets the current low the current draw into the battery and fixes the current draw and the resistance of the battery and that capacitor form a voltage dividing circuit. It just turns out to be a really swell circuit, really cheap and really reliable. And it also conditions batteries. You leave it on a little longer and uh, uh, lead batteries will uh, recondition themselves. It will balance all the cells out just on its own. Here's a picture of the, con of the finished capacitive charger. All these cans in yellow. They're about the size of a can of pop, each one. It kind of looks like a bomb, but it's, it's actually just a capacitors. It works really well. Now there's two car mod camps out there. There's Echo Modders and EV Converters. Echo Modders, they improve the fuel efficiency of their car by aerodynamic and engine mods and driving technique. In the EV side, they just convert the car to electric, but they don't really focus too much on the aero mods or driving technique. I decided to combine the best of both worlds, and I, as a result, I get fantastic range. So good that uh, some of my results were called into question by the online community. But uh, lead acid batteries they, and uh, good driving technique, it's a very cheap, affordable way to go. Now, uh, I also, as part of the aero mods, I put some metal on the front just to block the grill to keep the air out. And I also got these uh, pizza pans. I'm serious, literally pizza pans from Walmart. And I made them into hubcaps and took the existing hub cap, hub cap and modified it and put this pan on them and they uh, cut the air down, air drag down a little bit. I also put on rear wheel skirts and front grill. It's kind of a counterintuitive lay it does design. You'd think a big wall wouldn't help out but it actually uh, keeps the air out of aerodynamically dirty areas under the car. Um, and I also played around a little bit with um, covering the, making a kind of a makeshift tonneau cover for the truck. Ultimately, I'd want a teardrop shaped tonneau cover that goes from the top of the cab to the top of the tailgate. But uh, I also want to use the truck for practical uses for hauling things. So this one works as well. Now, the costs that I incurred to build this car was about 4200 bucks um just acquiring the parts, about $2000 in batteries including the Costco membership. Uh I spent about 1500 bucks on repairs and you know, wheel bearings and lower rolling resistant wheels. They were ex uh, extremely well worth purchase. Aerodynamic modifications. Um, I also spent about almost 1200 bucks on tools, you know, welders, impact wrenches, things I needed to get the old car out and to do some of the, the fabrication. And a lot of mistakes I made along the way. Just things added up. Altogether, though, Oh, I uh, also sold a lot of parts, and I was able to sell my old car and also get a tax credit. So altogether, I'm out eight thousand bucks for this car, including the price of the original donor vehicle, which was fifteen hundred bucks. So altogether, eight thousand, and that's essentially it. Here's a little chart showing the kind of the detail specs of my car. And if you're interested, there's more information on my website, johnsavesenergy.com. And thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope it's been beneficial to you. And I hope you can convert your own. Good luck.